So what is universal design for learning? This is something that I was really curious about, and I actually had the great opportunity to meet an amazing person, Dr. Katie Novak. And not only did I have the opportunity to meet Katie, but we also actually co-wrote a book together. We actually wrote Innovate Inside the Box, and it was one of the most awesome working experiences I've ever had. And so Katie and I, in this podcast, we talk about UDL, we talk about the innovator's mindset and the intersection between the two and why they're so important in this time. But we also talk about the process of writing, how we actually connected with one another and just have a lot of fun. So I, I really hope you enjoy this episode. Katie is absolutely brilliant. I love her stuff. I love the way that she actually brings um, these really complex ideas to a way that, you know, even to be honest with you, I can understand them. So just an awesome episode. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Hey everyone, this is George Carlos with another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And I have a very special guest today, Dr. Katie Novak. She is the co-author of the book, Innovate Inside the Box with myself. And it was such a wonderful experience. She has written a ton of other books that I'm sure she's going to talk about. Uh, so many that I, I, I can't even list them all. Uh, she's written many before me, many after. Uh, but when I wrote with Katie, it was an awesome experience we had met uh, a long time ago. And not only is she an, an incredible educator with incredible experience and, and vision for what education could be for every single kid, uh, she's also a wonderful person, and I, I, I'm getting to know her family really well, getting to know her dog really well, who has been an active contributor to this podcast today so far uh, in the recording that we've done. But uh, Katie's a very good friend of mine, and uh, I, I've learned not only learned a lot from her as a person, but just really admire her education experience, and writing with her is one of my uh, favorite professional experiences I've ever had. So Katie, Please introduce yourself and tell a little bit about kind of, you know, your educational background. Yeah, I, I am George's best friend. Uh, <laughs> <maybe>. <laughs> um, I've been in education for 20 years. I'm, I'm your best friend. Yeah, that's right. You are my best friend. Yeah, you're like top five for me. Okay, I'll take top five and that's huge. <laughs> So um, I've been in education for 20 years. I was uh, an English teacher, a full-time English teacher for 12 of those years, um, went to administration. I've been an ELL director, um, a literacy director for a district, and an assistant superintendent of schools. And um, also, I really am psyched about the fact that I get to consult kind of all around the world and just work with different educators and students and schools um, to talk about the power of design to really change the outcomes of the learners we serve. So in addition to being an educator and a consultant and an author, um, the most important thing I do is momming uh, four amazing kids who um, help me to remember that like the work in education that we do is like we're serving people's babies. And I just don't think there's more there's work that's more important than that. Yeah, and, and we actually just uh, recorded a, a, a little mini podcast before, and you can actually uh, watch it as well. And we talked about just kind of the, some of the inspiring teachers we've had, some of the inspiring administrators we worked with, and you know how hey, we start. And I, I, I loved uh, your answers, and it reminded me when, like, when I talk to you, I think you do. I, I know this is like a weird thing to say. I, I find that you you do a lot of really academic work. Uh, in that you're doing, which can be totally, let's be honest, dry and mm -hmm. hard for people to comprehend. But the way that you actually present it, the way that you connect it, the way that you share stories in the way that you're doing, make it more digestible and attainable uh, for people. So is this something that you like explicitly do? Is it just your personality? Or like, how do you bridge that where you take stuff that could be is, is important, but let's be honest, nobody listens to, it's hard to live, get through boring stuff, right? Like, how do you actually bridge that connection where you really focus on those stories, really focus on making that connection? So I'm super anti snooze fest. And so luckily I have two talents in life, one of which is woodworking, which has not served me very well as the educated right. community. But the other is, is I'm always thinking in metaphors and in analogies. I've always done that. Uh, since I was little. And I think that's why I was kind of drawn to teaching English is just like, I love a good story. And um, as you know, when I get ramped up, you're like, oh, is this like a story or is this a Katie story? Because the Katie story, like you get spirit hands, you get a lot of figurative language, a little right. hyperbole. But, you know, I think that so much of what connects us 
are, you know, the power of our stories. And so when trying to share like really kind of esoteric theoretical information, um, especially what I generally speak about is, is design work. So how do you universally design a system? It's difficult to get people really pumped up when you're like, let's talk about the difference between a theoretical framework and a conceptual framework. And people are like glazed like donuts when you talk like that. Right. And so a much better way to capture people is by telling stories. And I think you actually do the same thing. You're a great storyteller. Well, yeah, and I, I think that that to me is, is a, the funny thing is that like I'm known for my work in innovation, but storytelling is like the oldest practice, right? Like it's the most traditional practice in teaching and learning. And I think that the ability to tell a story makes stuff really simple and easy to connect. And that was one of the things that we talked about when we actually uh, wrote Innovate Inside the Box was we wanted this to, you know, give really concrete, practical examples. We wanted to bring research into it, but we wanted to make it really, uh, you know, connected. And I think part of that process was we actually saw each other. Well, let's be honest. <laughs> I saw you speak right? I saw you speak and I was like, wow, this person's awesome. Yeah. And then I was going to speak and you're like, I'm going to go shopping. Right. Listen, and then you just, I don't know if me. people realize how I, cute I, the like, are in Monterey. That's why, do you know why? That is why I am your best friend and mm -hmm. you're top five because my best friend would have stayed and said, you know what? That's this is small, like shopping will be there thing. tomorrow. Shopping will be there tomorrow. This, mm -hmm. this keynote George is doing, this is, this is today. But oh, you know, if I could rewind my life, <laughs> that's the one decision I would make differently. Exactly. Well, hey, why don't, like, why don't you talk about kind of like, you know, that the first time we connected and, you know, seeing some of the connections that, you know, when we talked about, because, you know, we read each other's books and, and, and really kind of like, how did we meet and kind of bring our work together in the first place? Right. So we were at this conference. It was like the, <laughs> you know, the California Instructional Steering Committee, which is essentially like a big conference for California superintendents. Um, it was in Monterey, which has adorable mm -hmm. tops. And so while we were there, we were and doing they're like only this. open for like an hour after your talk. So we were like kind of giving back to back keynotes and there was lunch in between, remember? Because like half of my keynote, people thought they were just supposed to pick up their buffet boxes. Right. right. So I was talking about um, this concept of expert learning. And so when we talk about universal design, people can get really lost in the weeds about what that is. Like, how do we design instruction that works for everyone? And to do that, we really have to embrace just kind of the variability and the differences among everyone. And we have to be like far more flexible about how we design. And the goal is if we do this well, we actually empower learners to be really purposeful and driven and resourceful because like we create the pathways and then they decide on the path. And so expert learners are those who we really empower to like reflect, to look at their options and then to create their pathways. And like you kind of sat down and you were watching it and afterwards you're like, oh my gosh, what you're talking about is the innovator's mindset. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I you know, I, I, I'm familiar with your work. I like, I know the book, but like, you really think it's that close. And you're like, yes, like go through the book with that lens. So then we did like pen pal, like I sent you my book, you sent me your book. And I read through it with like literally one sitting with a pencil and was like, oh my gosh, this is expert learning. And I think that it was an awesome bridge for like, how do we get students ready for college and careers or future ready? There's so many terms for the same thing. How do we create like thinkers and creatives who are competing with robots. And what you have done is you've created this platform of like, this is the innovator's mindset, but we're connecting it to the framework that is necessary for like equity, that is necessary for um, multi tier systems of support. And so it's like taking what we know is true about mm -hmm. best practices and creativity, and then linking it to like evidence-based practices which are so critical for school districts to kind of get behind given like a lot of the federal legislation. Yeah, and when we, when we kind of put the, like, to be honest with you, you, like if we go back in our history, mm -hmm. I, I had no interest in writing another book ever again. You were on me like, let's write a book together. I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Okay, <laughs> whatever wouldn't even stay for my session. <laughs> and so you were kind of on me and then I kind of had a light bulb of the connection and then we talked and probably when we 
when we talked about it first, I think we were done. Like, I don't think we started writing it about till two weeks after. And then it was done five weeks later from like that conversation, like, yeah, I'm ready to write a book. And the process of like what we did is that we, we basically said, let's like, let's, I'm going to write my part. And then you, I need you to kind of like fill in the blanks, give some of the strategies and connect. And so I would like write in the morning and that's kind of my process, you know, morning or afternoon. And then you would just kind of take whatever I wrote, connect it and, uh, and actually, you know, write this, the second part of the book. And so it, I actually, one of my biggest fears about writing a book with somebody else was I, I let, like, I understand the importance of collaboration. I know we talk about an education. I just like working by myself sometimes. Right. And because I'm, I'm, I don't have to worry about someone else's pace. I don't have to worry about that. And I, I found that was like a really awesome process for me because we could collaborate without, uh, kind of, I think sometimes collaboration is like a, a code word for like talking with no action. Like, it's like, we just talk in circles and like, you know, let's come, let's come back to that. Hey, that's mm -hmm. a really great idea. Let me sit on that. And like, things don't actually happen. So I, I really appreciated that process. And um, we had really great feedback on the book and, but this is my favorite comment ever on any book, uh, not even just mine. Okay, okay. I poured my heart and soul into this book. Yeah. And one of the comments was, could I use more Katie, less George? I'm going to buy oh, you a whatever. shirt that says that. More Katie, less George. More Katie, less George. Yeah. And I'm just going to get like shirts to say more Katie, less George. Um, I mean, I yeah. feel like that could be a big seller. I feel like that could be really good. <laughs> Um, oh, also, I was like, you know what? I didn't take it personally. I didn't, you know, I, like how long did I cry for? Three, four days, like whatever, right? But whatever, you know, it's the internet. You could just say whatever. There was, but it practically started I should, pro I should, I should just, you know, be quiet now and just give more, give the people what they want. More give, Katie. The so, give the people what they want, more Kitty. But no, the one of the best things about it too is how I knew that we like we're like friends for life is the first conversation we had is I thought it was so funny because both of us, I mean, my husband doesn't think I'm funny. I think I'm very funny. Um, and I'm sure you think I'm funny, but like I I, I like your husband. Oh yeah, because he's <laughs> like, Kitty, you're fun but you're not funny because people who are funny would never say they're funny. And the fact that you're always like, I'm funny is like, you're just begging someone to be like, Oh yeah, you are. But I'm telling I, you, just wait, before you tell a story, I got to just, here's an easy measurement. When you tell a joke, who laughs the most? I already know that answer for you. And I, I just mean, did it to myself. Cause I'm modeling. It's an exemplar <laughs> of what you should be doing. <laughs> okay, good. All right. So, okay. So sorry to interrupt. Our first conversation is there's like, you know, I finished my keynote and everybody's like, oh, Katie's done. But then like George walks in and it's like <sighs> the locusts, right? Cause like everybody loves you. So we have a ton of people around and you're like, Katie Novak, you have an age to day since high school. It's like a joke. And I was like, I don't want to talk about high school cause I'm still upset with you. And you were like, oh, come on. Like that was like 25 years ago. Like you just have to let that go. And I'm like, no, I'm still, my feelings are really hurt. And everyone was like, you two went to high school together. We're like, oh no, we've never met. And I still remember everyone being like, then what are you two doing? <laughs> oh no, this, this is just like, we're, it's a little improv, a little educational improv, but that was like such a funny moment. And that's why I was like, look at us, look at our connection. Like we need to write a book. Yeah. Well, we did. And, you know, it, it is special when you, you do connect with people like that immediately, right? Because I don't think it happens often, but we stay connected and, and connected to the point where I could say, you are driving me nuts. Uh -huh. Please stop. Right. And you, and, and I, like, I am, no. I am like default the brother in the, like the big brother. And you can be, you know, kind of the, you know, just getting on me a little bit. But yeah. I, I, still, I always love you no matter what. Okay. So sister okay so uh the, the school year obviously crazy right and this is this is being uh recorded in 20 at the end of 2020 but you're gonna you're watching this in 2021 and udl to a lot of people seems like this um really kind of far out uh it's only for certain schools and maybe even certain classrooms like a lot of people have that perception of it and i think it's really can be done in any school any situation and, but then you have remote learning, you have hybrid learning, you have, um, you know, face-to-face -face 
learning with literal dividers in between children, right? And you have that. So when you take the concept of universal design for learning and you actually apply it to like a really kind of flexible learning landscape, and you, that's a term that um, you and Catelyn and I were talking about yesterday that you, you two had brought up. Um, how do you see UDL in a time where there's so much just craziness and uncertainty of like even the environment that we're going to be teaching in? So a lot of people think of UDL as like something you do as a, like a list of strategies. And it's far more about like a set of beliefs or a set of principles. And with UDL, there's like three kind of core principles that have never changed. So universal design for learning has been around for 30, almost 40 years. And during that time, the strategies have continually evolved. Um, you know, the technologies have evolved, the strategies have evolved, um, just as the evidence base gets bigger and we learn more about the importance of, you know, critical thinking and the innovator's mindset. Um, what has never changed is the core belief. Um, and that is number one, that we have to embrace this concept of variability, that like people aren't static. Like they need different things at different times. And the traditional model of education was really focused on like, once you know a learner, you know what they need. Mm -hmm. And you can like slap a label on them like a price tag and then you'll know about them. And so like a really concrete example is like, you would say, I'm a strong reader. You could hand me a piece of text, I could read it. Um, but if I don't have my contacts in, I can't read it. And if I have a migraine, I can't read it. And that just shows like learning is contextual. And so when we embrace the concept that not only are learners different from each other, but they're actually very different day to day based on their mood, we have to design something where learners get to create their own environment. That's the first thing is like, we can't possibly know what everybody needs more than they know that themselves. So number one is like just this concept of variability means we can't possibly ask everybody to do something in the same way at the same time. Um, the next is this concept of like really firm goals and flexible means. So like, what is it that we actually want students to know and do? And let's strip all the crap away from that. Like all the things that are standardized, all the things that are one size fits all, because we have like these really, really open standards. Like students will explain the causes of the civil war, for example. And then it's like, you got to read this chapter of the textbook. You got to take this right. multiple choice test. You have no idea if kids can explain the causes of a civil war, if that's the goal. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be really flexible about like, what really is the goal? And then based on variability, how do we provide like multiple pathways for, these are all the ways you can learn about the cause of the civil war. Here's materials that you can use if you get stuck. Here's materials you can use if you want an extra challenge. Here's all the ways you can share what you know. And that requires all those pieces of that innovator's mindset, which is like, I have to be reflective. You know, I have to be self-directed, you know, all of that work. And then the third belief is that there's value in expert learning. There's value in putting the learner in the driver's seat to make those choices. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very different model because like in a traditional setting, it's like, I am in charge. I look at the goals. I decide how everyone's going to learn it, the materials they need and how they're going to share what they know. But that doesn't embrace variability. It doesn't build expert learning. And it's not the only way to meet the goals that we're required to build. And so when you think about UDL in this new landscape, which is very flexible, you know, a lot of people are like, okay, we were in person and now we're remote or hybrid, but then we're going to go back to in person. Eh, false. We're not. Okay. Right. It's always going to go back and forth. Like, why would you call snow days? Why would you continue to have school if 20% of your kids had the stomach flu? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that we're going to have to be ready to evolve. And so in doing that, we have to design learning where we say, how do we design a collection of resources that can be accessed in the cloud? Because whether you're home or in person, you can still access them. Mm -hmm. How are we going to you know, provide opportunities for students to share what they know and make sure that they have the resources to do that, whether they're at home or whether they're in person. And so I just don't see how you could teach in a flexible learning landscape if you didn't have a kind of a a buffet of ways for students to learn and to share what they know. And that is, is really what allows learners to become learners. It what allows us to do much better in more standardized measures. But the, the biggest part of that is that you're embracing student identity and student differences, which traditional systems did not do a great job mm -hmm. of meeting the needs of diverse learners because of this one size fits all thinking. So I actually like, I'm listening to you and I was thinking about 
I remember working with this teacher who is legitimately one of the nicest people I've ever worked with and really kind, love kids, uh, want to have an impact. And obviously the stuff that you and I, like the stuff that you just shared is stuff that I believe, right? Really understanding that kids bring different strengths, they have different interests and how do you tap into it? Like I always use example, like, you know, you, you talked about open the, like, why do we, why did every kid need to read the Great Gatsby in high school? Was the curriculum must read Great Gatsby or was it like certain reading things? Could I have read a book on basketball or magazine or things like that? And would that have actually made me a better reader because I could read about things I was interested in as opposed to like, I don't really like fiction books, right? And I'm, I'm to be honest, you still to this day, which a lot of teachers get mad at, but a lot of people, a lot of teachers didn't do music and that benefited me tremendously. A lot of teach, or teachers didn't like sports that benefited me tremendously. And so those gifts to have, but this teacher that I worked with, um, I remember her saying this, and this is one of the reasons I liked her so much. She was very honest with me. She said, you know, I became a teacher because I wanted to be in front of the kids. I wanted to lecture and give inspiring things. The very traditional, like, the, I always kind of think about like dead poet society. I think about mm -hmm. um, the, I, I, like, I, I, the stand and deliver um, movie, the traditional like inspiring teacher that gets on the desk and does that stuff. And she was honest that I don't necessarily want to, you know, recreate this, you know, the structure. I want to be like what basically the, the movie teacher, like the, I don't know if that's because I don't think teachers even see it that way. Um, but it, like, it was really interesting. So when you have someone who got into teaching for like a different reason than, than maybe what you're talking about right now, how do we help move them forward? And, you know, like, how do we, and how do we know that I, I guess, how do we know that we're right? Because I'm not saying she's wrong. She was very good at that pro pro process. You know, a lot of kids loved sitting and listening to her. My concern is that not all, not all teachers can like be very dynamic in front uh, of kids all the time. And you almost create a dependency upon the teacher giving you, you know, really compelling ways to, to listen to things, but it doesn't necessarily make you a great learner when you walk out of there. So I don't know, like, what are your thoughts on that? So I have kind of two thoughts. The first thought is that in an inclusive classroom, that would never work because you have to predict what about students mm -hmm. who um, struggle with auditory processing? What about students with hearing impairment? Um, what about students with attention disorders? Okay, talking to students is just not going to be effective to all students, period, yeah. end of story. So it doesn't matter how compelling and how brilliant your presentation is. Mm -hmm. If there are not other ways to learn, some students will be excluded. And I think that's the first thing is, traditional education actually excluded kids by design. You know, if you couldn't learn in this way, let's put you in a separate setting. And now that we're really focused on inclusive practice, that requires inclusive placement. And in inclusive placement, you're going to have students who are English learners, who are newcomers, who don't have a handle on language yet. Me talking in English, no matter how many gestures I use or how much I love kids, doesn't equate to understanding if there's not an option for translation, to access visuals, to work with manipulatives. So I think the first piece is, is there is not a single one size fits all practice that will allow all students to learn. So the flexibility in the first place needs to be about access. So, you know, when we think about universal design, we think about access and we think about engagement. So, you know, teachers who are often like, but kids are into it, we're often talking about engagement. I make it enjoyable for kids. They feel the connection with me, but it's not accessible, okay? Handing out a printed text is just not acceptable, not accessible or acceptable mm -hmm. in a diverse inclusive class because you have some students who are not reading at grade level, some students who might have visual impairments, some students who are English learners. So a one size fits all text is gonna be extremely exclusionary. Um, even if you do have all learners, that's kind of the answer you're going for. Even if you do have all learners, let, let's say that you have a classroom where nobody is struggling with auditory processing. Um, you're not dealing with ADD, visual impairment, hearing impairment. That'd be nearly almost impossible in an inclusive classroom. But let's just say, for instance, that you don't have access barriers or you don't have a lot of variability with the ability to access you at that point are, are taking away opportunities for students to get to know themselves as learners. And it is absolutely creating this learned helplessness that, that 
students feel like they need a teacher to tell them what to do in order to learn. Right. As opposed to this is the goal. Here's some options I designed. Take a couple of minutes and think about what's the best way for you to learn. After you're doing it for 15 minutes, we're going to check in, do a formative assessment. So you can think about, did you make a really good choice? Do you need more from me? Um, and in that, I would always provide an option to work with me in a small group. So for the teacher who loves the read aloud, who loves to sit on the floor and do the read aloud, that's an awesome option. But if that's the only option, some students are not going to be able to, to be truly immersed. Um, they're not going to be able to access and they're not going to be able to engage with curriculum that is rightfully theirs. Yeah. And like one of the things that really was a light bulb for me, and I, this is one of the reasons I really liked writing the book with you, was was having the conversation about teachers feeling like, why well, can't do this all the time in every curriculum area and every strand or objective or whatever you call it, wherever you are in the world. And to me talking about that, like it, part of, part of that is almost when we always are removing barriers for our kids, we don't actually teach them the importance of doing that and advocating for themselves. And what you had said to me is like, no, part of this process, and I'm paraphrasing and correct me if I'm wrong here, I'm paraphrasing when, when you say this, is like, you also have to teach kids how to do that for themselves, how mm -hmm. to figure out like, hey, this is what I need in this time. And you know, this is what's going to be most beneficial to me. Because I think the the fear of this for a lot of teachers, like, I can't keep up, right? Like, how can I have this classroom with all these differing needs, and always kind of take care of them, but they kind of see it as like one person doing it for everyone else, as opposed to one person teaching kids how to actually advocate for themselves. And I don't know, like, can you expand on that or am I totally yeah, off? Yeah, absolutely. Or, so, that. you know, a part of one of the tools that I created with CAST and CAST is the organization out of Harvard University that created the UDL framework in the mm -hmm. early 90s. And I created a tool with them called the UDL progression rubric. And essentially at the beginning, like kind of at a very emerging stage of UDL implementation, the teacher is giving the options. And so I might say, okay, little guys, we're all working on animal adaptation. And so, you know, you get to choose which animal you want to learn more about. And then once you choose, if you want to do this animal or this animal, you can choose to learn about them, you know, in videos or in looking at books in the classroom library or in doing your own research. You can work alone or you can work as a partner. And then you're going to share what you know. And you're going to do that by either creating a slideshow or a poster or like a, a written piece, right? So the teacher is doing all that work. Um, when you move to a more proficient area of UDL, which is the next step, a teacher is actually going to probably provide fewer options but also provide the option to create your own option. So I might say later in the year, all right, everybody, you know, we're working on the life cycle of a star. Okay, that's a science standard. We need to understand how stars kind of over their life, life cycle, like produce elements. And um, so, you know, really think about the best way for you to do some research, um, you know, take some time. Um, are you gonna wanna go to the library and find some books? Are you gonna wanna search for some videos? You know, the librarian showed you how to use, you know, noodle tools and things like that. Um, and then, you know, certainly um, I would encourage you to make a traditional paper. Um, here's a graphic organizer and here's how I'm going to grade it. If you'd like to propose another way to answer that project, then absolutely take five minutes and decide, could you meet this rubric in another way? Okay, that's proficient UDL. Right. So it's almost like we're going really heavy on the scaffolding just so students know there are options. When we talk about like expert implementation of UDL, the teacher is much more the facilitator because mm -hmm. the teacher is like, okay, let's talk about this goal. Okay, like, you know, the goal is, you know, just let's go back to the civil war. The goal is to explain the cause of the civil war. How do you all wanna learn it? Um, what materials do you think we're gonna need to have available? How do you wanna show me what you know? Let's create a rubric together. Like it becomes almost like, a true partnership of the innovator's mindset and that we're co-creating really flexible standards-based curriculum. And I'm constantly checking in. I'm constantly giving feedback. I'm carving out time for reflection. I'm carving out time for goal setting, but we can't just jump to expert learning because if you haven't gone through that progression of like, you could do it this way, or you could do it this way, you know, this is how you use a graphic organizer. This is how you find really good resources. But like after a couple months, 
of, of an emerging kind of um, uh, practice, students will start to go, remember that time when you let us do that? Could we do that on this? Well, I don't know, look at the rubric, propose to me. Do you think it will meet the criteria? Okay, cool, why don't you try it? You can always revise it, right? It's a totally different class. And when we're thinking about doing this online, right now people are feeling buried planning things online right. it's because the teacher is putting everything online. Instead of saying like, what are some ways that you want to learn? Um, what are some ways we could do this differently? Are there any tools you're working on in other classes that like maybe, you know, we should have as options here? We don't have to take on so much ourselves. Well, they actually, like I, I wrote this in Innovates of the Box and you, you reminded me of it as I'm listening to you that a teacher once said to me, the more innovative I've become, the less work I've had to do. And I remember having that conversation because it wasn't just about kids um, you know, kind of leading their own learning and taking some of those things that we traditionally did as teachers off of the plate of the teachers, which is actually, and I always say this, that sometimes what we consider teaching is learning we're taking away from kids. Like you, you give the example of, of uh, you know, posting things online, as opposed to saying like, hey, we want you to find this, here's some criteria, tell me why it fits this criteria, and then you can actually post it and share it, right? And so all that, like it, you might be talking about, for example, a, a strand in math, but what I also taught there was like finding information, analysis of that information, skills that are really important, right? And, and I think that's a really important aspect. And the one thing you said to me, and I share this with groups that I talk about all the time, because we know there's things that have to cheat. Like we still have standardized tests in many places, you know, they're probably coming back for many uh, states and, and provinces right now. And we know that things have to change, that there's a lot of, you know, growth in education as there always has been. Like I look at where education was when I was in school versus now it's come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. And there will never be a point where like, Hey, it's perfect. Right. Like it's always going to get, but you said this to me, um, that, and you said this, I don't know why you said this specifically. You said this, this year for our grade three kids, this is their one year in grade three. That's mm -hmm. it. And so how do we ensure that we make that the best experience possible within the constraints that we have to deal with, with any of the things that we have to do? And I think having that mentality is something that's really important to me because yes, we got to continue to advocate that we need to change um, what education looks like for kids. And to be honest with the adults as well, because a lot of adults are almost kind of, you know, checked out of education because it wasn't what we signed up for. It wasn't what we believed it could be. It's a lot of uh, stuff that administrators maybe pile on to teachers, not because of their own fault, but, you know, maybe not seeing like what, what is the role of what we do in education. So I, I think that's something that I advocate for. Now, let's go off of education for a little bit and get to know Katie Novak. So we, I think I'm a little bit older than you. I'm not 100% sure. I'm pretty sure I'm a little bit older than you, like maybe a couple of years. Oh, right? I'm 41. Okay. So like, yeah, okay. So you live, you grew up in the United States. I grew up in Canada. When yep. you think of high school and you think of that time, what music did you, what music do you associate with high school? Oh, like really bad music. Oh, um, give, me, give me some bands. Like a uh, little salt and pepper, <laughs> uh, maybe a little Casey and Jojo. Um, it was okay, like, okay. Casey, hip -hop Casey and Jojo. Okay. Baby, 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 I was going to say, name, name three songs from Casey and Jojo. Oh my Okay, so I knew you were gonna say that one. That's one, two, and three. Uh, <laughs> way oh, boys to men, boys yeah. to men. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna tell you a story right now because you know what? That's what the listeners want. More Katie, less George. When I was in high school, I was date proposed to. Like, you know how they do promposals now? Yeah. That's the thing. Prom proposals. Like, I'm gonna basically get down on one knee and ask you to go to prom. Well. When I was a little freshie in high school, um, somebody who I'm actually very good friends with now, we stayed friends, he was a junior and we were in ceramics class together. And one day I came in and everyone was looking at me. So like right away, like I was like, something's weird. And he and I were partners on this like really cool project where we had to make a plate of food out of ceramics. And we did like a, a kind of Chinese food takeout. So right. like pork fried rice, egg roll, whatever. So it was time to paint it. And so... <laughs> I go over to the desk and he's like, I put the newspaper in the desk. So can you take that out to paint it? And I'm like, okay. And people are staring at me and I reach into the desk, boys to men comes on the stereo on a cassette tape, right? 
And I pull out a thing of roses and he gets down on one knee and is like, will you go out with me in front of everyone? And then obviously, <laughs> where'd we go on our first date? Where? Come on. I don't know. What did we have to eat? <laughs> a pizza? You I have don't know. To know. Yeah. Are you huh? even listening to the story? <laughs> he took me out for what kind of food? I don't know. What kind of food? Did Chinese you food. That's what we made in ceramics. <laughs> we belong together. And you know <laughs> that I'm right. Well, well actually, it's funny because bo boys to men. Okay, so this is the the age difference. Boys to men was my favorite, like was one of my favorites when I was in high school. But they didn't get into like the like end of the road. I'll make love to you stuff. They got they, it was like the Motown Philly song. Your eyes, make a wish. I love I love boys to men. I um, I, I still we love saw boys them in men. concert two years ago, and it was awesome. It's so good. It's it was so, so good. good. It was yeah. so good. Okay. So, hey, if you are watching this on YouTube right now, I would love, uh, what was your, when you think of high school, what music do you think of? That is like the question of the day because we want to hear that from you. But um, mm -hmm. Katie, thank you for speaking more. And I did <laughs> Thank you for sharing more. And I did say, oh, brother, I, I love will, you. I will, uh, Try to figure out the official talk times of this because you know that's that's what the people want. Right? That's what the people want. More Katie, less George. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey Katie, it was awesome talking to you. Uh, make sure that you follow Katie Novak on Instagram and Twitter. I'll post and you know look at a copy of Innovate Inside the Box. One of my favorite, and actually, you know, a lot of people said it was actually you know better than innovators mindset, which I take as a compliment. I know that that's hugely because of all the contributions and, and just the stuff that you had put out there. So um, it, it really meant a lot to me. I, I love working with you and uh, we do a lot of projects together, but it's good. We have this time to kind of chat and hang out. So uh, thanks for taking have listening everybody. And Although take care. we've come <laughs> to the end of the road. End of the road. I can't let go. Can't let go, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.